Think of our soul, of our life, of question of good and evil. Those are universal. But the actual ideas, challenges that come up are not the same. And one of the greatest challenges that modern humanity faces is precisely to be able to accept the multiplicity of the voices of God without losing one's faith in one's own religion. That is the one new thing. I always accept what Aristotle said, there's nothing new under the sun. But this is the only exception, really. And there are other elements of the Quran where there's greater need for elucidation now, certain cosmological ideas and so forth, which have to recast a challenge to modern cosmology, which is really simply an extrapolation of terrestrial physics. But new ideas coming out all the time. One day somebody says God created a big bang, then three days later, no, there's no need for God. The big bang could take place by itself. And all of these things that go on, we need to have an Islamic response to that, the roots of which are in the Quran. And we must avoid all of the shallow scientific and modernistic interpretation of the Quran, which have weakened the whole Islamic intellectual life during the past century. We must be able to be non-confessional. It's not easy. I'm a Persian, the descendant of the family of the Prophet, and born as a Shiite. But I have to speak in such a way that the Sunnis will also listen to me. And you see how difficult the situation is when I wrote my ideas on Islam. Uh, the famous uh, Indian Muslim scholar, Maulana Nadwi, was still alive, or Hassan Nadwi, of lockdown. And many very pious Muslims went to him and said, this book has come out. Do we have a right to read this book or not? It's written by Persian Shiite. And he read, a book, read the book and wrote me a beautiful letter, which unfortunately, like everything else I had in Iran, was lost during the revolution. But uh, he said, not only that, I'll be glad to give a fatwa. You should all read it. <laughs> now, this is our duty of your Islamic thinkers today to not to follow the trap of tribalism, confessionalism, nationalism, ethnicism, and all of these things which unfortunately divide human beings, not only Muslims, but Christians, Chinese, Indians, everywhere all over the world. This is part of the human predicament in our world today. And finally, we must be able to address the contemporary mind. In order to do that, we must know the contemporary mind. The time when people especially Muslims, write comedies on the Quran as if they were addressing the people at Assad University but publishing it in second-rate English are over. They're useless. We must be able to convey this message in a language that's understandable. This is precisely what the Muslim scholars did when they went to Persia. It's exactly what they did. And the great translation, which is anonymous, the first translation of the Quran, a beautiful Persian, who did that? Somebody facilitated that, and 50 years later it came out in Gujarati, a very difficult Indian language, because this transmission was there. Now, of course, Persian is still there. I think it's the most beautiful language in the world, but I'm prejudiced. But the language of Hafez and Saadi and Gujarati is there, and this is there. But now, the English language must be treated, actually, as an Islamic language. In the same way that Bengali, which was there before Islam came into India, was a Hindu language, it was Islamicized to the extent that it's one of the major Islamic languages. And the commentary upon the Quran, discussion of the Quran, the translation of the Quran in the English language must be done in such a way that we can forge out of the English language a language that can express things Islamic. In the same way that the Christians forged the Latin language, which was a Roman language, completely so-called pagan, into becoming the liturgical language of the Catholic Church. Those are very, very difficult tasks to achieve, but with the help of God, all things are possible. Thank you.